So for me, one of the best things about having a sci-fi YouTube channel is I get to really geek out with you. And I also get to make some pretty arbitrary choices when I'm making top five lists. So here is the definitive list of the top five starfighters. So a couple of weeks ago, I made another top five video. I'll put a link to it here for you in case you fancy it. But I made the mistake of insulting the Millennium Falcon. And since the Star Wars fandom is like a cult with gang affiliations, I've been advised for my own safety that I must include this vessel on this list. So at number five, the Incom T-65 X-Wing Space Superiority Fighter. Christ, what a mouthful. Before I go any further, I am of a certain vintage and I prefer Star Wars Legend over Star Wars Canon. So in universe, the story goes that basically Incom were asked by the Imperial Navy to design them a Starfighter. They had looked back on their previous work and came up with the X-Wing and they were so confident in their design that they produced loads of them. Unfortunately though for Incom, during this period, the Imperial Navy went through a change in its doctrine. What had changed was that the Imperial Navy no longer wanted a highly capable, yet expensive and complex fighter. They wanted something cheaper, faster and highly manoeuvrable. So this is why they opted for the Sinar Fleet Systems TIE Fighter. And this decision really knackered Incom actually, because they had spent a lot of money designing and building the X-Wing. So with that in mind, they didn't take that much convincing to defect really to the Rebellion. The X-Wing weighs 10 tonnes and it's about 13 and a half metres by 11 and a half metres wide. It is piloted by one rebel pilot with an astromech droid. Most famously of all, Luke Skywalker and R2-D2. I actually think Wedge Antilles is the better pilot to be quite honest with you. It's got a class one hyperdrive and it's got four Tame and Back KX-9 laser cannons. It's also got two Krups MG-7 proton torpedo launchers. Back in the real world though, the X-Wing was designed by Colin Campwell, who had worked on the film 2001 A Space Odyssey with another star of this list, Douglas Trumbull. But why is it on my list? Why is it number five in the top five Starfighters list? Well, apart from the threats I've had off the Star Wars fans, it's a really, really cool ship. The design is really evocative of those World War I biplanes you used to see. But I think more importantly than this, more importantly than its call factor, which is really important to this list, you got to look at where science fiction was in the mid 70s. Star Wars changed everything in science fiction. Because before Star Wars, we was getting some really great science fiction films. Films that I've already covered on this channel. But in the 70s, there seemed to be an ongoing theme of despair in science fiction. You see this in films like Capricorn One, for instance, which is all about conspiracy and about mistrusting the government, for instance. Or you get really dystopian stuff like Logan's Run. Silent Running even, That's, that can be really depressing to watch at times. Filmmakers, I think at that point, science fiction filmmakers at least, I think they've sort of forgotten that sometimes a film needs to be genuinely really uplifting and really, really fun. But when George Lucas came along with Star Wars, that's what it did. It made science fiction fun again. And that philosophy is distilled into the X-Wing, in particular the scenes what the X-Wing is actually in. And that dogfight over the Death Star is absolutely brilliant. It is the most fun you're gonna have in science fiction. And that scene in the trench where Luke Skywalker gives up and he gives into the force and he destroys the Death Star is possibly one of the most uplifting moments in science fiction history. And it is the X-Wing that enables that. And if you don't believe me and you don't agree with me, could it have been that exciting if it had done it in a Y-Wing? The answer is no, by the way. And in actual fact, you forfeited your right to disagree with me the moment I posted my opinion on the internet. So Star Wars changed everything. And I've got to be honest with you, apart from all of that, most of the science fiction we got afterwards, most of that fantastic stuff we got from the likes of Battlestar Galactica, Star Trek The Next Generation, even down to really crazy stuff like Space Precinct, 
you wouldn't have had without Star Wars because it proved there was a market for it. It proved that people wanted to go and see this sort of Buck Roger-esque saga in space, which segues me quite nicely to number four. The Earth Director at Thunderfighter, 30 foot long and weighing 14 and a half tons and capable of about 40% of the speed of light, as well as being properly tooled up and all. It's got eight laser cannons. Personally, for me, the Thunderfighter is just one of the prettiest starfighters of all time. It's got that twin boom design, which is really sort of reminiscent of those old P-38 Lightnings, which is where I'm guessing it gets its name from, isn't it? You know, Thunder, Lightning. When we first get introduced to the Thunderfighter, it's getting his ass handed to it by some space pirates. And it's only the timely intervention of Buck Rogers and his very unique style of dogfighting that saves the day. Because as we see, all the other pilots are just following the computer. Whereas Buck, well, he teaches them to fly by the seat of their pants again. And it's this scene, actually, that really helps sell the Thunderfire to me. Because at the end of the day, this is a kid's program. It's aimed at families, but it's little kids that are watching it. And if you're a little kid watching that scene in particular in the 20th century, you ain't got the understanding of an adult. You don't realise certain things. So in your mind, you can travel to the 25th century. And because you've played a fair few computer games in your time, well, you can teach those 25th century idiots how to fight space pirates. So for me, that's a major reason for it. But in reality, is this. If you don't know about science fiction, you won't know this, but Ralph McQuarrie is a titan of the genre. The work he done on Star Wars is iconic, but it's not just that. He also worked on Star Trek as well, not just the TV series, but the films. He done work with Steven Spielberg on the Indiana Jones franchise, but really, as far as I'm concerned, he's got the triple crown of sci-fi because he's worked on Star Wars, Star Trek, and Battlestar Galactica. It's also worth remembering with a Thunder Fighter that it's one of those very rare designs in sci-fi that if you just drop it into any other franchise, it will just work. And I get the sense that the design for the Thunder Fighter was in his mind one of the earlier designs for the Viper. So on that score alone, the Thunder Fighter makes it onto his list at number four. But I can hear you now banging away in the comments, hey, why didn't you just choose the Viper for this one? Well, be a bit patient. But apart from all of that, apart from the designer, the look of it, the backstory to it, it's Buck Rogers' ride. Buck Rogers is one of the coolest dudes of all time. And if it's cool enough for him, then it's definitely cool enough for this list. Number three, the Mark IX Hawk. 18 metres long and weighing in at an impressive 128 tonnes. It's got a maximum speed of 0.22c. Again, this one's really tooled up. It's got three laser batteries and carries 16 space-to-space -space missiles. That, alongside two fusion torpedoes, and it's crewed by two. You've got a pilot and a navigator gunner. So with Space 1999, it shares its universe with the other TV series, UFO. So in universe, the Mark IX Hawk is the successor to the Shadow Interceptor. It was designed in the mid 80s with the idea in mind that this alien invasion was gonna be a lot more protracted than it actually was. So three of these were to be stationed on the moon and another six or so was gonna be hidden in the Mojave Desert. So in universe, it is a far more capable design than the Shadow Interceptor. But why does this one make it to number three on this list? Why out of the thousands of Starfighter designs there are, why is this at number three? Well, there's the obvious. I mean, if you're a long-term viewer of this channel, you know I'm a massive Jerry Anderson fan and I weren't gonna do a list like this without him rearing his head. But there's so much more than that. There's so much more to this starship. So since I've been doing YouTube, I've developed a real appreciation of Space 1999. I think that the Mark IX Hawk does for Starfighters what the Eagle Transporter does for spacecraft in general. So there's that, yes, but there's also the fact that it only appeared in one episode, but it's got a legacy amongst the fandom that really outweighs its single appearance. I genuinely feel that if Space 1999 had existed without the Eagle, people would still be talking about the Mark IX Hawk now. Brian Johnson done an amazing job designing this one because, yeah, like the Eagle, it just looks like it worked, but also it works really well within that universe. Visually, it is plain to see that it is meant to be from the same family as the Eagle, but 
its design really helps carry the narrative of the single episode it appears in. This thing looks genuinely evil. It looks like it's supposed to be what it is, the eagle transporter's spiteful little brother. A spiteful little brother that makes mincemeat of its big brother in a dogfight. So that's why it's at number three on this list. It's there because it appeared in an episode of a really obscure sci-fi program 50 years ago. Yet people still make the models of it, they still talk about it, they still love it. Number two, the Supermarine Spitfire. Designed by R.J. Mitchell and it was the backbone of the RAF. Well, at least for the duration of World War II, that is. With a crew of one and an armament of anything from Browning 303 machine guns to Hispano Suiza auto cannons to laser cannons in this case. And I can already hear the comments incoming. Hey, British sci-fi, you've gone absolutely crazy. Well, I am crazy, but that's another story. Let me explain. So the Starfighter variant of the Spitfire appeared in two episodes of Doctor Who. It appeared in Victory of the Daleks and A Good Man Goes to War. And it is absolutely bonkers and absolutely brilliant when you see it because this thing makes mincemeat of a Dalek saucer and utterly obliterates Demon's Run. And kudos to Mark Gatiss here for coming up with this one because, as I said, it is so much fun. And he is the only person to actually write an episode of Doctor Who and star in it as well because he voices the pilot of this Spitfire. In the UK, we love the Spitfire. It is iconic to us. We have a cultural affinity with this machine more than any other man-made object. And to use it like this in a television show which is so culturally significant to us is a stroke of genius. But the Spitfire has appeared in media literally hundreds of times. So why is it here? Why is it placed so highly? Why is it the second greatest Starfire of all time? Well, it's the audience. Doctor Who is a family show, yes, but it's aimed at children. And I don't think there's been a British child born since like 1940. Up until the present day, that hasn't owned a Spitfire toy. And at some point or another, during that play, the runners-up of World War II have taken that fight into space and the Spitfire has risen to meet them. So what Doctor Who was doing here was something absolutely brilliant and that was how children play. They can make literally anything happen. The writers and the producers of this show captured something especially amazing. They captured the moment which happens in every child's life where the toy in their hand doesn't match the game they're playing in their head and it does not matter to them because their minds are so creative, they can do whatever they want. You haven't got a toy APC, don't matter. I've got a toy bin lorry, that'll do the trick. You ain't got a toy sword, don't matter. I've got to chew off some wrapping paper, that'll do. My mate's on crutches, he's got a broken leg, don't matter, because now we've got two machine guns we can play with. And yeah, I'm having a space battle, but I've only got a Spitfire, don't matter. Spitfires can fly in space. So yeah, that's why it's at number two because it captures a moment in a child's life which is just so amazing and it does it in such spectacular style. God, I really wish Mark Gatiss had produced Doctor Who full time. So we're here, number one, the greatest starfighter in science fiction history. Bear in mind what I said at the beginning that this is the definitive list. Don't even bother searching for other lists of this type on YouTube because this is the definitive one of its type. It's the most authoritative list and possibly the most arbitrary. So, in our number one spot, we have the Viper Mark II. Yes, 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 as I speak, I can hear your howls of derision, but it's number one for some very, very good reasons. 8.4 meters long with a crew of one, with two wing-mounted mass drivers and some hard points for some other guided munitions. So, Galactica starts out with an initial complement of 40 of these. Although well, it must be said, they were museum pieces. During the first hours of the Cylon attack, they are rapidly pressed into service and go on to form the backbone of Galactica's fighter complement throughout the series. So Ronald D. Moore has stated that the only thing he wanted to keep from the original Battlestar Galactica was the Viper. And when you're working with something of that pedigree, it's easy to see why. Because the original Viper was designed by Ralph McQuarrie, who, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the kings of science fiction. So for that alone, it fits on this list but why does it deserve the number one spot? For me at least, it takes something from every ship on this list and does it better. It's cooler to look at than the Thunderfighter. By a country mile, it is more recognisable than the Mark IX Hawk. It is even more bonkers and fun 
than the Spitfire. So I was going to put the Star Fury on this list. But the Viper just does it better than even that. So what about our number five entry, the X-Wing? Well, yeah, the Viper nicks its colour scheme and it looks pretty cool in it as well. But it does a lot more than that. I mentioned where sci-fi was in the mid 70s and the fact that Star Wars just utterly revolutionised the genre. Well, that's what Battlestar Galactica did when it was reimagined in 2003. Because all of those children that had grown up loving Star Wars, well, they were now adults and they were now working in Hollywood and they were now making the decisions. And they were asking the question at this point, hey, space operas are great, but is there space to make a space opera that tells more mature stories? And that is exactly what the reimagined Battlestar Galactica did. It took a middling 1970 space opera and they reimagined it into a really gritty, realistic, grown up and mature masterpiece. And just like how the X-Wing distilled all the fun and all the adventure and all the swashbuckling spirit of the original Star Wars film into one ship. All of the grit and the darkness and the mature tone of Battlestar Galactica is distilled into the Viper, yet it still finds the space to look just amazing and be really fun. Starbuck and Apollo look easily as cool as Buck Rogers does in his ship. Starbuck even has a spiritual awakening in her Viper in the same way that Luke Skywalker does in his X-Wing. And in the way that the X-Wing influenced design going forward and the way that science fiction stories were told going forward, the Viper does this as well. So yeah, we'd seen Newtonian physics being used in Babylon 5, but I've seen a lot of science fiction. And it's the first time I've seen a mass driver being used as a weapon and use a genuinely grounded military setting as well for it. And just as Star Wars gave us the template for everything up to and including Battlestar Galactica. BSG gave us the template for everything we've got now, from the expanse to for all mankind. So that's why it's at number one. That is why to me it is the greatest starfighter of all time, because it does everything every other ship on this list does, but better, but has an influence far beyond the confines of its own show. So that's my list. Thanks for watching, and please remember it's just a personal view. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching to the end if you've made it this far. Please hit the old like and subscribe button as well if you're still here because YouTube can be a very cruel and unpredictable mistress at times.